Hi, welcome back to our discussion of some organic chemistry. Last time we talked about carbohydrates, and this time we're going to talk about lipids. Um, so, uh, in terms of lipids, uh, lipids are really characterized by their chemical properties. And so, as what we have is a lot of carbon, a lot of hydrogen, and then a small amount of oxygen. Now, because of all the carbon and hydrogen, that means that a lipid is going to have a large number of non-polar covalent bonds. Now, that makes it hydrophobic. This means water hating. That's synonymous with non-polar. So lipids, they're not going to dissolve in water. They'll dissolve in other oily things, but they won't dissolve in water. So let's take a look at a typical lipid, and we'll start off by looking at a fatty acid. So here's a diagram of a fatty acid, and this is stearic acid. This is what you commonly find in butter. So you can see that we've got um, a small amount of oxygen down here, and that's a, a, a new type of functional group that we're going to introduce. I've introduced the hydroxyl group here when we looked at carbohydrates. So a hydroxyl group is an OH. And this new functional group in this kind of dark orange highlight here is a carboxylic acid group. And that's characterized by a C double bonded to an O and then a C bonded to a hydroxyl group. Now that's the only place in this whole molecule where we find any polar covalent bonds. There are so few covalent bonds, uh, polar covalent bonds that are um, that are in this molecule that they're not going to contribute to the molecule being uh, polar at all. So this molecule, when we take it in its whole, is completely, as far as we're concerned, is completely non-polar. It's hydrophobic. It won't dissolve in water. So it's what we have is we have this carboxylic acid group at one end and then we have a long chain of carbon and hydrogens um, and here every carbon in the chain has got two hydrogen atoms attached to it now that's going to become important in a moment when we talk about saturated and unsaturated but that's our basic structure of a fatty acid it's called a fatty acid the acid part comes from this carboxylic acid group over here on the left in orange and at certain ph uh, uh, neutral ph for example this carboxylic acid group um, will lose the hydrogen the hydrogen ion will uh, the hydrogen will leave as an ion so leave as a proton leaving a negative charge behind in the form of an electron and so because this molecule will dissociate to release a proton that increases the proton concentration in solution. So the proton concentration in solution goes up and the pH goes down. So that's what makes this um, uh, an acid. The fatty part comes from all of the non-polar covalent bonds which make this, this tail here completely hydrophobic. So I mentioned just now that um, and the carbons and the hydrogens are going to become important when we look at saturated versus unsaturated. So let's take a look at that and talk a little bit about structure and function really quickly in terms of the fatty acids. So um, at the top is, again, stearic acid. That's the molecule we saw just now. And, but at the bottom is what we have is oleic acid. That's what you find in olive oil. So when you think about fats, fats kind of come in, well, lipids kind of come in um, two types. Those which are... Um, solid at room temperature and those are fats and then you have lipids which are liquid at room temperature and those are oils so things like olive oil peanut oil safflower oil they all have fatty acids which have this kind of structure at the bottom and the characteristic there is that the fatty acid is bent whereas um, lipids fatty acids that you find in fats tend to be straight like this stearic acid so what causes the oleic acid at the bottom here to have this bend or this kink in it well it's this double bond here between these two carbons in the middle of the chain so if you look at this in the little space filling the ball and stick model at the bottom is what we see is that this carbon here is only covalently bound to one hydrogen and the adjacent carbon is only only um, covalently bonded to one hydrogen, whereas all the others have got two hydrogens attached to them. So when this happens, a double bond forms between the two carbons. And in some configurations, when you get the two hydrogens on the same side as one another, this this causes what's called a a, um, a, a double bond. And this is in the cis conformation, and that's going to introduce a bend or a kink to the molecule. So what that means is that if you've got a lot of these bent molecules, they can't pack together tightly 
slightly in our oily things, fatty things, they tend to stick together because they exclude water. So oily things come together, and you've probably seen this, if you put some drops of oil in a, in a, in a, a saucer of water, they'll actually kind of uh, come together and then they'll stick together and exclude the water. So fatty things will tend to stick together and exclude water, um, but these fatty acids can't pack tightly together if they're bent. So if we're trying to pack all these bent things together, we can't, and there'll be more molecular motion, and that'll give us a liquid. So if we've got dead straight things, these can all pack together, and we'll get a solid, uh, something like butter or margarine, something like that. Okay, so that's saturated versus unsaturated. That's gonna have some interesting consequences when we look at membranes, because membranes are primarily composed of, of, um, of, of fat, fatty acids attached to some, some other, other molecules, which gives us something called a phospholipid, which we'll look at in a moment. Okay, before we get to phospholipids, let's take a look at um, a storage uh, lipid. Uh, let's take a look at triglycerides and look at their structure and see how that relates to their function. So, it's what we talked about when we talked about polysaccharides, is how you join all of these sugar monomers together to get these long chains, which may be straight chains or branch chains, depending if we're talking about cellulose or starch and glycogen, for example. The chemistry is exactly the same to build a triglyceride, except the kind of mechanics uh, and the structure that results are a little bit different. So uh, let's see what we've got here is in terms of the basic building blocks. So there are four building blocks that we need to make a triglyceride. Three of them are the same, and here they are, three fatty acids. Now these don't look as long as the fatty acids we just looked at, but they are actually very long molecules. You can see in the middle here, where it says CH2 in brackets and there's a 15. That means that CH2 is repeated 15 times, so it's a long chain, just like we saw with stearic acid. So we've got three of these fatty acids, remember they're acids because of the carboxylic acid group, and then we've got this molecule here, glycerol. So we've got three fatty acid, that gives us the tri part of the name, and then we've got glycerol, which gives us the glycer part of the name, and is what we're gonna do is join this glycerol to these three fatty acids. Now, this is exactly the same chemistry as we saw for joining two monomers, two sugars together to make a disaccharide or in a chain to make a polysaccharide. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the hydrogen here from this hydroxyl in the glycerol. We're gonna take this hydroxyl from the fatty acid. We're gonna link those together and hopefully you can remember what you get if you take hydroxyl and you add another hydrogen to it you get a water molecule, right? So if we link these two pieces together using condensation chemistry, we're gonna get a water molecule. We do the same down here and then a third time at the bottom. So that means to make one triglyceride, we do three condensation reactions and get three molecules of water. And what we produce is this molecule here. So this is a storage, uh, an energy storage molecule. It's a fat. And so this is what accumulates in adipocytes, which are the main cell type you get in fat tissues. And so why is this so good at storing energy? It's because these these um, non-polar covalent bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen and the carbon and the carbon, they store a lot of chemical potential energy. So when we break those bonds and we take the electrons and make new bonds, um, we release a lot of energy. And so that's the relationship between structure and function here. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of uh, non-polar covalent bonds and they store a lot of chemical potential energy. So as you're looking at this structure, you wanna be thinking about what can I deduce about its, about its properties? So we talked about just now how these are fats and they don't do well, they don't dissolve well in water. So pretty easy question you should be able to answer right now is that if we take a look at this, this triglyceride, is this molecule largely hydrophobic or largely hydrophilic? Okay, so that's enough on triglycerides and fatty acids. Uh, let's take our understanding of fatty acids and, and now look at another type of uh, lipid called a phospholipid. And so phospholipids are gonna become super important when we look at membrane structure and function. These are the basic building blocks of your membranes. This is one of the most important lipids we're gonna talk about in this section. And it's gonna come back and understanding its structure, understanding how its structure relates to its function is gonna be critical in understanding membrane structure and function. So let's take a look at the structure and then we'll take a little bit of a look at how that affects its, its, its functionality. So with a phospholipid, we've got um, a modified form of, of glycerol here in this light orange, and then we've got 
uh, two fatty acid tails attached to the modified glycerol. And attached to that is a new type of functional group we've not seen before. This is a phosphate group. So it's a phosphorus that's attached to uh, five uh, to four oxygen atoms, and it's making um, one, two, three, four, five covalent bonds there. And you can see that one of the oxygens has a net negative charge. So attached to that phosphate group, and you should be able to recognize the phosphate group, we have um, some other arrangement of, of functional groups, and we're not going to get into this right now. This part of the phospholipid can be variable, and so different phospholipids have different structures here. So phosphatidic acid, a type of phospholipid, doesn't even have this part in blue. Uh, phosphatidyl choline has a choline molecule attached here, and you don't have to know what those are. You just need to know this variability here. Phosphatidyl ethanolamine has an ethanolamine structure attached here. So what we have is a region down here which is hydrophobic. These fatty acid tails, remember, they're going to be hydrophobic. And then we've got a region up here, which you can see has got some charge or has got some of these polar functional groups. And so this part up here is significantly large enough and significantly polar to start trying to dissolve in water. But this part of the bottom is not. Um, and so we have a special word for a molecule which has a large region which is polar and a large region which is nonpolar, and we call that amphipathic. So this molecule is going to behave very strangely if you put it in water because the top part up here is going to try and dissolve in the water, but the fatty acid tails are going to want to stick together. And that's the basis for forming membranes. So these phospholipids form structures called membranes. They surround your cells, plant cells, bacterial cells, and then they surround a number of organelles inside the cells, if we're talking about eukaryotes, of course. So top left up here, we've got a little diagram of our phospholipid, which we just looked at. Fatty acid tails in black and white for carbon and hydrogen. And then we've got some uh, phosphorus and some oxygen and additional carbons. And then we've got uh, usually a charged head group at the top here. So biologists like to make these little diagrams, these little models, which represent the chemical structure. So the two wiggly legs here on this on this little kind of... Uh, uh, representation here of phospholipid, the two wiggly legs of the fatty acids, and then the ball represents um, what's called the polar head group. Now, if you put the pole, if you put this phospholipid in water, um, it's going to be kind of a bit confused because the polar head group wants to try and dissolve, so water will arrange around the polar head group, but water will be excluded from the fatty acid tails. And if you put a bunch of these in water, the fatty acid tails will all stick together, and um, and the, the the polar head groups will try and associate with the water and two things can form there one they'll form these these kind of spheres called micelles which we're not worried about the other structure they'll form is called a bilayer and so the bilayer is the basis of a membrane and so what's happened here is that if we put these phospholipids in water um, and your cells are surrounded by water and inside is predominantly water so um, is what happens is the polar head groups all point towards the water so that could be the inside of the cell. And then the fatty acid tails will stick together. And the next layer of fatty acid, uh, phospholipids, the, fa the, the polar head groups will point towards the water on the outside. And the fatty acid tails will point inside. So we get this bilayer of two layers. And so the, the fatty acids stick with themselves. And like sticks with like. And the polar head groups associate with the water. And so you can see that in a bit more... Uh, detail down here at the bottom. And so what you end up with in a membrane is this hydrophobic center and these very thin regions of, of polar head groups. And this hydrophobic core to the membrane is the basis for its selective permeability. And we're going to come back to that when we talk about uh, membrane structure and function a little bit later. But what I want you to see here is how the structure of the phospholipid allows it to arrange into this structure, the bilayer. And you should be able to draw this and explain how this forms based on the structure of the phospholipid. Okay, so let's look at another class now. Uh, this will be our last class of, of uh, lipid that we'll look at. And um, we're going to look at steroids just very, very quickly. So here's a steroid. It's cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is a steroid molecule. And you find this in your membranes. So this actually has some interesting uh, chemical properties and some functions in your membranes. Now, people tell you cholesterol is a bad thing. And too much cholesterol is definitely a bad thing. If you've got high cholesterol, you, you want to get that in, in check. But you do need some cholesterol because it's an important component of your membranes. Uh, there are some drugs on the market which 
help to reduce the cholesterol if you have very high cholesterol. Um, the trouble with that is that if you overuse them, you interfere with cholesterol levels, and cholesterol is used to make some other hormones like testosterone. And so uh, some men which have overused some of these cholesterol-lowering drugs have actually interfered with their testosterone metabolism, and they end up um, kind of losing their masculinity. They start generating a lot of fat tissue on their breasts. Um, and so you know, not enough cholesterol can be a bad thing. Let's look at the, the, the steroid molecule. Like we saw before, it's a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogen. So this is a predominantly hydrophobic molecule. There's one small hydroxyl group down here. It doesn't contribute in the slightest to this molecule dissolving in water. So cholesterol, it's actually a component of the membranes, but steroids, um, they're also a big class of hormones. We've got testosterone in there and estrogen in there and a number of other hormones that are derived from cholesterol. And so they become important when you start learning about endocrinology and when you start taking some classes in physiology. So that's just a little bit about steroids. Focus on uh, not learning these structures because you're never going to remember all this stuff, but looking at it and uh, recognizing some general structures and saying, well, this molecule is going to be predominantly hydrophobic and it's not going to dissolve well in water. So, um, as always, there's going to be a lot of stuff that I've not covered here that, that you want to, to kind of uh, brush up on and, and, and help yourself out with by doing some reading. That's all on, on the learning outcomes. So, your quizzes and uh, your tests, they are going to be based on your learning outcomes. I cover a lot of it here, but not everything. So, take a look at the learning outcomes. And when we come back next time, we're going to start looking at proteins uh, in my opinion, possibly one of the uh, most interesting and important sets of organic polymers that we have to deal with in general biology. So I'll see you next time.